Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Rock Center for Corporate Governance at Stanford University and our program. My name is Mike Callahan. I'm a professor of the practice here at Stanford Law School and the executive director of the Rock Center. Before I introduce our distinguished guest and first speaker, I would like to thank Tatiana Rodriguez of Sullivan and Cromwell, the staff of the Antitrust Division at the Department of Justice, and Monique Norquist and Jody Carrion of Stanford Law School for their work in preparing this event. I would also like to thank Sullivan and Cromwell, and in particular, Renata Hesse and Nader Musawi for their great support and partnership of the Rock Center. And now I'd like to introduce Macon Delrahim, who was confirmed on September 27th, 2017 as Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division. Mr. Delrahim previously served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy White House Counsel, where he worked on judicial nominations and notably the confirmation of now Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch. He is a former partner in the Los Angeles office of Brownstein Hyatt. Previously, he served at the Antitrust Division in the George W. Bush administration as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General, where he played an integral role in building the Antitrust Division's engagement with its international counterparts, representing the Department of Justice at the International Competition Network and the United States at the OECD. Previously to that, Mr. Delrahim served as counsel and later as the Staff Director and Chief Counsel of the United States Senate Judiciary Committee under then Chairman Orrin Hatch, where the matters he worked on included judicial confirmations, international copyright reform, the Patriot Act, and legislation that created the Department of Homeland Security. Please join me in welcoming Assistant Attorney General Macon Delrahim to Stanford University. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for that kind introduction. And let me add my thanks to uh, not only Stanford and the staff, but also at the Antitrust Division, uh, everybody there, including the leadership, and particularly my chief of staff, uh, Taylor Owings, who has done an incredible job um, in a short period of time and, and helping putting t this together for us. Um, I appreciate again the opportunity to sort of come back to Stanford and uh, the Rock Center. Uh, it's bittersweet. Last time, as you will recall, I spoke at Stanford was about six months ago and um, would have very much enjoyed the opportunity to travel back to my home state of California and be there in person. But nevertheless, we are, uh, I'm grateful and honored to be amongst you and to do this through a Zoom. Uh, and I remotely wish everybody health, happiness, and same childcare. Uh, we all are struggling through this, but the good news is, uh, you know, we're all in it together and we all uh, have the resources to, to fight through. So we'll continue uh, to do what we can to remain safe. Um, you know, first, look, I should start with a quote from the actress Lauren Bacall, who said, quote, standing still is the fastest way of moving backwards in a rapidly changing world. Well, in February, I gave the opening remarks at the workshop we jointly held at Stanford on venture capital and antitrust. And in those remarks, I observed that both venture capital and antitrust are, are often about predicting the future competitive dynamics of competition. It's not pure guesswork. Rather, we draw on our experience and make educated predictions. These tough decisions are necessary not only to survive, but to thrive. Very few observers, I think, would accuse the antitrust division over the past three years of, quote, standing still. Today, I'm pleased to announce three new changes within the antitrust division to help us continue to evolve with the modern economy and to make us more efficient as we do our work to protect competition using scarce taxpayer dollars. These changes draw on my experiences from the nearly three years as the Assistant Attorney General and reflect the economic evolution that began before my time at the division and also before the time when my uh, colleague and friend, Renata Hesse, uh, who's with us today on these panels, uh, was in charge of the antitrust division last. Uh, first, we are reallocating the commodities or the industries that we review across the civil enforcement sections of the antitrust division. In Washington, DC, civil enforcement is divided across six different sections. 
each with responsibility for specific so-called commodities. We make changes from time to time to ensure we build expertise efficiently and reflect changes in the economy. Since the last commodity reorganization, which was nearly 20 years ago, the economy has undergone major shifts. FinTech is disrupting and revolutionizing the financial and banking sectors. Media, entertainment, and telecommunications are rapidly converging. Digital platforms and technology companies are among the most valuable and powerful in our economy. The antitrust division, I believe, must respond accordingly. Until now, the enforcement of mergers and conduct in financial services, banking, insurance, and credit card businesses have been spread across four different sections of the antitrust division. Media, broadcast, and telecommunications have been divided between two sections. And under the new reorganization I'm announcing today, we will dedicate a single section to all of the financial services. We will also combine our media and telecommunications work into one section, which in turn will allow our longtime technology section, which until today was called the technology and financial services section, to focus 100% of its energy on the growing digital economy and the unique characteristics of certain current and emerging platform-based business models. The new financial services section will build expertise across the waterfront of FinTech, making it well positioned to understand how new entrants in these areas may spur competition with and among traditional players. This section can make the most of some recent matters and initiatives we've been pursuing at the antitrust division. We remain active in banking and financial services. In 2019, we reviewed the BBNT and SunTrust merger and required a multi-billion dollar divestiture uh, across seven geographic markets. We are, we are currently reviewing several significant financial technology transactions, including Visa's acquisition of Plaid, among others that are not yet public. More than just policing transactions as they come in, we need to be prepared to take proactive steps to protect healthy competition in each of these markets. In June 2020, just a few months ago, uh, SEC Chairman Jay Clayton and I announced the first ever memorandum of understanding between our two agencies. The MOU extends the strong working relationship between the SEC and the Antitrust Division. It will lead to even greater collaboration and cooperation to ensure that we maintain the efficient and competitive financial markets on which American investors and consumers rely. Moreover, we're equipping our respective staffs with the tools to understand these markets as they evolve. At the Antitrust Division, over the past year, I launched a new training and development initiative, and we have enrolled our attorneys and economists, myself included, in courses at the MIT's Sloan School of Management to better understand the emerging implications of blockchain technology and artificial intelligence. Combining our media and telecommunications commodities <clears throat> reflects the new reality that these industries have been and are converging. Most Americans, especially these days, are enjoying their entertainment through streaming services and not through the traditional broadcast or linear cable television. Many continue to cut the proverbial cord and are consuming media through mobile and other devices. It no longer makes sense for one division of the section, uh, one section of the division to handle broadcast television and another to handle cable television. Combining these responsibilities reflects the integration in these industries and will streamline our enforcement and review in these sectors. Finally, it's no surprise that technology and digital platforms are, inc are increasingly a focus of antitrust review. The section currently called Technology and Financial Services, TFS, has spent a lot of time on the T uh, this past year, and this alone must be a full-time job. The section's financial responsibilities will move on so that it can continue to build upon its expertise in the digital economy and the existing and emerging platform.
of business models. Reallocating the commodities is just the first change we are announcing today. The second equally important change is the creation of the Office of Decree Enforcement and Compliance. We're given it an acronym, ODEC, as we do in the government. This new office will have primary responsibility for enforcing judgments and settlement decrees in civil matters. The office will work closely with the antitrust division's attorneys, monitors, and compliance officers to ensure the effective implementation of and compliance with these agreements. Uh, the ODEC will serve as the dedicated watchdog for judgment and decree compliance, reinvigorating and re rationalizing the division's approach to consent decrees has been one of my major initiatives since the day I started. I first laid out my vision for this office in 2018 at the University of Chicago. Protecting competition requires getting the right answer. Sometimes that means allowing pro-competitive mergers to close without taking any enforcement action. Sometimes that means suing to block a transaction, and sometimes it means allowing a merger to proceed subject to a settlement embodied in a consent decree. In the coming weeks, I'll announce changes to the Antitrust Division's merger remedy manual that will more accurately reflect the, our current practices and provide the business community with greater transparency about the way we will uh, address remedies in a merger. A settlement and a or a consent decree, we must remember, is a commitment by merging parties to the antitrust division and to the American consumer. It protects competition only if enforced effectively. The reality is that there are over 150 consent decrees in effect from just the past 10 years. Too often, companies make promises to the American people only to turn their back on some of those obligations when they feel that the cops are not on the beat. With this new dedicated office, we will make these commitments a priority and enforce them proactively. No longer will lax compliance go unnoticed. Just to illustrate with a couple of recent examples, this past Friday, we moved to amend the judgment related to the CenturyLink level three merger because the merged, merged company was not living up to its obligations. Among other things, we required CenturyLink to accept the appointment of an independent monitor and pay the United States to defray the costs of the investigation. This action follows closely on the heels of our recent consent decree enforcement against Live Nation. And, and that decree was the result of Live Nation's acquisition of Ticketmaster. There, our investigation found large scale violations over a period of years. Our enforcement action resulted in significant decree modifications, reimbursement of millions of dollars in fees, and extension of the decree with Live Nation. Most significantly in both of these enforcement actions, we insisted on our new standard provisions that makes enforcement easier, especially with an office singularly dedicated to proactive compliance, those provisions will have meaningful impact for the economy. Further, the ODEC will, will be the antitrust division's primary contact for whistleblowers and citizen complaints who have information regarding uh, potential violations of settlements with the division. I'm pleased to announce that Larry Riker, a career attorney with the division who also had an illustrious career in the private sector in New York before, has agreed to lead the ODEC for us. Larry won the, the Department of Justice's highest award for his leadership in reviewing and leading to termination nearly 800 outdated consent judgments as part of the judgment termination initiative. And he aggressively will enforce those that will remain. Finally, the third change I'm announcing today is the creation of the Civil Conduct Task Force. This task force, in my opinion, is an initiative whose time has been long overdue. This task force will focus full-time on civil non-merger work. It is this, the, the CCTF is designed to help ensure that when the division gets busy with merger reviews with statutory deadlines, that there's still an independent group of dedicated attorneys with the mandate 
to execute against aggressive timelines in, uh, in our non-merger cases. I'm excited to see that the task force will build competencies that are unique to civil conduct cases, where the key questions and the posture of the parties under investigation are quite different from merger investigations. Yet the design of this, this task force will ensure that these competencies are shared with the civil sections and the field offices in San Francisco, Chicago, and New York when they lead conduct cases as well. That's because the CCTF will be comprised of both a core group of fully dedicated attorneys, and in addition, attorney designees from each of the six civil sections and our three field offices. All members of the task force will be staffed on the task force led civil conduct investigations. The section designees will channel the expertise of the section to improve the casework of this task force. It will also have the responsibility to field citizen complaints about alleged anti-competitive conduct not related to a merger. With its division-wide perspective, I think this task force will be able to help prioritize complaints and investigations for, for more effective enforcement of our antitrust laws. These three organizational changes, the reallocation of the civil sections, the establishment of the Office of Decree Enforcement and Compliance, and the creation of the Civil Conduct Task Force are designed to lead to more efficient and effective allocation of our resources within the Antitrust Division, and more proactively uh, enforce the laws when there is no statutory deadline like we have for merger reviews. These changes are all designed to ensure we're fully prepared for the antitrust enforcement challenges that are coming tomorrow. We have some of the finest legal and strategic minds in the country assembled today, and I'm just honored to be amongst you. So I look forward to the Q&A and the panel discussions that will follow. Uh, and again, I wanna thank Stanford for helping us host this and also the organizers of the event today for allowing me the opportunity to announce these important changes and to discuss them in the upcoming Q&A and the panel discussion. Thank you. So thanks, Megan. Um, it's terrific to see you, uh, even though from afar. Um, and I think the next, uh, the next thing that we're gonna do is Raj Cohen and I are gonna ask you a few questions and then we're gonna transition to a panel discussion. Um, for those of you who are in uh, the audience, if you have questions, we're asking you to put them into the chat. And um, uh, Jamelia Ferris, who's also here, and I will kind of moderate those and try to get them to make in as we can. Um, so Raj, I think I was gonna kick it off to you for the, for the first question, if you're there. I am, hopefully you can hear. Uh, so Macon is, we'll discuss a bit later, uh, at least speaking for myself, think this reorganization is both timely and highly relevant um, to the industry as a whole in, in, in analyzing competition. So could you, I ask if, uh, to give a little more thinking about what prompted the, uh, really the com combination of finance and technology? Sure, you know, uh, well, thank you. And uh, uh, I hope that it'll be timely and it'll continue to uh, improve the division's uh, work. Um, so we've seen a handful of transactions, uh, mergers, and as well as some conduct, where we have now seen that the, uh, you know, the, the, the typical breakdown of the commodities amongst the various civil sections have evolved uh, as new technology has developed. Um, and so the traditional boundaries don't seem to make sense. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, insurance is handled by one section. Our banking, and as you know well, Raj, is handled by our defense industry and aeronautics section. Our credit cards are handled by our media section. You know, securities exchanges handled by our technology financial services. It made no sense. And I thought that with a lot of the 
changes that is going on, particularly in, in financial services, but certainly in other areas, um, that we will be able to combine the expertise and better tackle the competitive dynamics that we must understand uh, in, in, in all of these industries. Uh, not only, I think, will we be, be able to better appreciate some pro-competitive efficiencies of upcoming transactions, but also better understand uh, perhaps some motivations where there's disruptive technology uh, that might disrupt an incumbent um, and see if there's, uh, if there's you know, really anti-competitive either motivations or effects uh, that is behind uh, that particular transaction. So I think the American economy has, has changed so drastically with these developments that it made sense to combine that expertise uh, and put combine them all together. Let me ask, uh, if I may, one other question, uh, then Renata will have some, and that goes to your comment right at the outset uh, that nobody would ever accuse you of standing still, at least not accurately. So I'll, along those lines, when do you see the reorganization actually taking effect? And I've got to add this. I really appreciate in discussing timing that you referenced Lauren Gopal because that was the name of my first and one of my most beloved dogs. So. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I'm glad that I used uh, that quote. Um, so as far as when it's taking effect, it is taking effect as we speak. So the uh, we're aware of the changes that everybody at the division we have you know we've had to work a process to ensure and, and take I think any decision that you hope is long lasting that will last you know beyond my tenure at the antitrust division and be a positive improvement uh, requires a consensus not only from the private sector but within the division and those who it'll affect and we've held a number of meetings and a lot of this was a result of that so the division um, is going through that now we're assigning uh, transactions along the lines of the breakdown of the commodities we are going through as renata knows well we can't change the actual section names quite yet until we have official approval of our organizational chart which is going this has already gone through the justice department it has to go through doj omb and then get a congressional assent uh, those, the names will occur as soon as that is done, hopefully within the next few months. But the actual function is changing. ODEC is up and running as of earlier this month. And Larry has been quite active in providing, you know, uh, his input, in, including the settlement in, uh, in CenturyLink we announced last week. Um, and then the conduct task force will be up and running probably in a couple of weeks. I am in the process right now of interviewing the finalists who will lead that from amongst the division. I'm excited about the enthusiasm that a lot of staff have shown to lead it and the expertise that we have in the division. Uh, so we're going through that. I expect within the next two weeks, we'll announce the leader and then uh, to staff them, we're asking for voluntary uh, expressions of interest among the staff who want to move and into these two new offices or two functions. Um, and that is occurring right now. So we announced that last Friday internally and are uh, reviewing the applicants for that. So it is uh, in flux as of now. So, so following up on that, um, Macon, we had a question in the chat about where uh, people could go to find out about these changes uh, on the division's website, or is your speech going to be published, or how, how do people get get more information? So we will publish the speech uh, either later today, hopefully. Uh, that will be, as, and then we'll also have a set of uh, FAQs that we will also post that goes into a little bit further uh, detail about these three changes. Both of those will be available on our website. Great. 
And um, having sat in your seat before, I know that uh, change is not always uh, welcomed uh, with open arms, depending on um, how people feel about it. So uh, just curious what the reaction of the uh, career staff was to the changes. So, you know, look, as you know, uh, as well as I, there's, we, we have probably the best collection of staff uh, in all of the federal government. I've been in at least three or four different offices within the executive branch over my career. And uh, they're just some of the finest attorneys, finest legal minds, uh, and versatile attorneys and economists and, uh, and, and paralegals. Um, we, I can't speak for every single one of them, but the emails that I have gotten, I've heard significant positive feedback and then through the process of reorganization, we were able to get a lot of good positive feedback. Uh, one of the reasons we, that led to some of this reorg was about two years ago, uh, the chief of my telecom section, Scott Sheely, came and said, look, you know, this, the industry is changing. The work of the section is either, you know, we either have mega mergers like AT&T, Time Warner, and Sprint T-Mobile, or we, we don't have much. And there's a lot of work that per, is, permeates from one section to those depending on resource capabilities. And it made me think that and probably the BBNT merger made me think that there's a broader reorg that makes sense uh, to do that. So uh, it has been a very positive response and, and you're right, not many of the changes I've implemented have, have come with uh, great enthusiasm, but all three of these changes uh, has been, uh, I've heard significant positive feedback. So will the reorganization affect any ongoing investigations? Will they get slowed down? Is, are there gonna be any changes to anything that's kind of currently in process? Um, it should not. I don't believe that there is, there, there is no current matter that will be uh, slowed down, whether or not any of them will be switched from one section to another will be on a case by case basis for the ones that are existing. And then, you know, the new ones will be assigned in according to the new commodities, but it would make no sense for us to, you know, switch. But it, remarkably, as we've looked at the inventory of our current investigations, as well as merger reviews, um, very few are going to be actually affected because they're going to stay with those folks who have the expertise in the section. So, you know, uh, the, the public one visa plaid transaction is within our MEP group already. A lot of the MEP commodities are moving into tell and that's going to be the renamed financial services and fintech group. And so it'll remain with the same core group that's going to be doing the work. Great. And moving quickly to the uh, to ODEC, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the impetus behind formation of a of a compliance uh, enforcement and compliance section? Sure. So both, you know, it, it, just the experience the last few years, and then also going through my confirmation process, I would always hear about, you know, there were the two the, at the time two consent decrees: Comcast Universal and Live Nation Ticketmaster that a lot of the members of the Senate at least cared about. And it was that we're not paying enough attention to them. And as I came in, what I noticed is because the division's resources are so scarce and you know we have been pushing the, the, a good 20% increase in our budget request that's pending before Congress now for fiscal year 21 and also fiscal year 22 that's already started. And um, you know, over the years, we're effectively down about 25% in real dollars for the division. Uh, so because of the scarce resources and the statutory deadlines we have for merger reviews, you know, if something is not a priority, it falls to the back burner. And so I wanted to make sure that we have a core group that is full-time looking at it proactively and um, looking at all of these. And at the same time, you know, as you know, we did that review of about 1,300 pending consent decrees and uh, systematically reviewed each one to just get them off the rolls, um, uh, including Paramount Consent Decree, which just two weeks ago was terminated, that 
we'll be able to focus on them and then enforce proactively. So call the compliance monitors, call the companies. Hey, we're told this, can you tell us what, when you promised to, uh, to live up to these commitments, what have you done? And there's, uh, so I think, uh, you know, a lot of companies with consent decrees will start getting phone calls. And uh, I think that's gonna be a good, healthy a way to enforce the commitments uh, that some of these folks have made as in past transactions. Right, and, and will any of the criminal program be overseen or involved in the, in the ODEC um, section? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so that office will also provide input on analyzing corporate compliance programs. Uh, uh, so that is last June, you might recall, I announced another a major initiative crediting uh, corporate compliance programs at the charging stage of a cartel investigation. It was the first time in history that we you know, added to our amnesty program to allow for that. And that's a way to really help deter the type of con conduct that occurs and reward good corporate citizens. And so that office will be involved in making sure that there is a uniform set of standards for which we will look at that the criminal sections, the two in Washington plus the three in the fields will rely on. And, uh, and then once there is a compliance program as part of a plea agreement or a DPA, uh, that they will continue to be on top of that. So yes, this office will have both some civil as well as some criminal responsibilities. Right, that's actually, that's super interesting because one of the questions coming out of that compliance program was, was precisely this, how are the, how are the programs gonna be judged and across what kind of landscape and metrics? So that's, that's, that's an interesting, uh, it'll be interesting use of, of the new section. Um, Picking up one last question on, on ODEC, um, actually it's two questions kind of blended into one. So there's a compliance section over at, uh, over at the FTC. So I think there's gonna be questions about, you know, how similar will ODEC be to, to the compliance section at the FTC? And in particular, whether or not the ODEC is gonna be involved in negotiating remedies, for example, um, as the compliance section is over at the FTC. So there'll be some overlap of the types of responsibilities they have, but it'll be different. So I, you know, we've, we've looked at various models in designing it and ODEC's primary focus will be on just the affirmative enforcement um, and monitoring ongoing decrees, interacting with the various compliance monitors. You know, we have several recent uh, 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 significant Did we lose Macon? I can see Raj, but I don't see Macon anymore. Do we? Here he goes. Oh, can you? Uh, you're back. I lost you briefly. Can you hear me again? We can. You're back. <laughs> I was going to say that it's, you know, it, the office is housed and reports through Dorothy Fountain, the uh, chief legal advisor, where consent decree advice and modifications to any provisions are provided. So they will provide advice to each of the sections, but the negotiations will be done by each of the substantive sections. And um, on the on the the civil task force, so I, I've now forgotten the full acronym CCTF. TF? CCTF, civil uh, conduct task civil force. Civil conduct task force. Um, is it sounds like that's going to be some combination of uh, people out of the sections and uh, and a new section itself. Can you describe a little bit how it's going to be composed? 
Sure. So if it is, and, and, and it's designed uh, with purpose uh, for this. So it'll be, it'll have a leader of the task force, three full-time uh, task force members, um, and then it'll have nine from each of our six civil plus our three field offices designated task force members. Uh, in addition, it will have, you know, economists applied case by case from our economic analysis group. Uh, the idea behind it is you'll have, again, a, a dedicated full-time group that can build the expertise necessary. So in a merger matter, as you know, the parties, you know, the leverage model in cooperation with the division is a little different. Merging parties have a, a greater incentive to comply and provide the data and the documents we need for a review because they would like to get the deal done. And there's a statutory process by which, you know, there's a give and take that, that uh, goes on in that review. When you're investigating a non-merger conduct case, the parties can, you know, it's a different litigation model and different muscles that need to be used. And therefore, to combine that and the expertise we already have in the division into one group that does that and knows how to move these cases forward and then prioritizes the cases in the division. So each of the sections will have uh, you know, skin in the game. They will funnel their conduct cases, the, re the case recommendations for a PI up to the front office and to the assistant attorney general will include, it'll originate primarily with the task force leader, but will also include the chief of that section. So let's say it's a healthcare conduct matter, it'll include the healthcare consumer product section with them, and it will funnel up and be prioritized to determine, is that the best use of the division's resources? Uh, or is there another case that we should focus on? And then vice versa. So if you know, they'll provide that expertise we need uh, to that, that, that civil section who might already have a case. And um, just looking at the last couple of years, uh, you know, knowing that those skill sets are going to be really key in how you go about doing it, uh, just like you would in a law firm or a, you know, in a corporation, you know, you might have your litigation partners, you might have your regulatory partners and corporate partners, and each of them bring different skill sets. I thought it was important to build that type of expertise. The one thing different from the uh, anti-competitive conduct uh, group, uh, the section of the Federal Trade Commission, which I thought this was important, was I didn't want to put all conduct amongst this new section because uh, I think there's a lot of value in understanding competitive dynamics that each of those sections uh, develop and they understand, uh, one. And then two, for recruitment, uh, making sure we have the best and the brightest at the division. Some people don't just wanna do merger work. They want to come in, do merger, do litigation, do a combination. And uh, this allows for that design to occur while we're still building the expertise that's necessary. Great. So I'm going to pass it back to Raj, I think, for our last question. But I will say that, you know, um, Raj often functions not only as, you know, a, you know, the, one of the best banking lawyers in the country, but also one of the best antitrust lawyers in the country. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I know what you mean about spreading out um, uh, expertise and making sure that uh, it's developed across uh, across disciplines. So with that, Raj, I'm going to pass it to you for the last question. And then after that, we will uh, go to the panel discussion. Sure. Uh, thanks, Renata. Moving Macon away from a merger context with the new CCTF, are there any uh, non-merger trends in the financial services sector that have either prompted this approach for financial services or uh, are of concern at this point or just of interest? So, there are, um, there have been a handful of uh, non-merger matters uh, that we have been involved with, but uh, we're seeing a lot of, you know, well, let me also say as part of this, we're seeing a, a lot of vertical mergers within the financial services industry. 
uh, we recently dealt with the, uh, uh, the London Stock Exchange Group and Refinitiv, uh, which was fascinating because it had both horizontal and vertical aspects. Uh, we're seeing a lot of different types of financial uh, products that are being combined and disrupted. And so uh, some of them could be very pro-competitive and that's a positive thing and, uh, and having a better understanding uh, within the section uh, helps us be better enforcers because uh, if there's pro-competitive, uh, efficient uh, developments that will come from the transaction or the type of conduct, we want to encourage that and we want to encourage you know, those changes that are occurring just because the economy is changing. Every consumer is now engaging its financial transaction through its telephone. Um, I haven't downloaded it yet, but most of our transactions are paid by my wife through her Venmo account or through something else, Zelle. And um, I, I've noticed a lot of us are using a lot less checks. So we're seeing uh, a lot of that. And by combining them all, we are uh, looking, I'm hoping to foster a more realistic view of the emerging markets and the types of businesses that are coming forward. Great. So with that, I'm going to um, hand off my moderating duties to Jamelia Ferris and welcome uh, Jared Fishman and Colleen Honigsberg, Honigsberg from, um, uh, Jared is from uh, SNC and Colleen is from uh, the Stanford Law School um, uh, to join us uh, for the panel discussion. Great. Great. Well, thank you um, so much for having me here today. But obviously, the conversation so far has been so interesting to me as an antitrust lawyer. And as Macon just suggested, it's also quite interesting as a consumer because all of the commodities that are being moved around, these are the commodities that all of us use on a day-to-day -day basis. We interact with them in our practices, but we also rely on them in our everyday lives. So I think we're going to touch on some of that in the conversation today. So Raj, I'd like to start with a question for you, um, given your history in the space, as Renata noted. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the evolution of the financial industry and how that revolu evolution has intersects, as you see it, intersects with the reorganization that Maka just talked about. Well, sure, and thank you. And I think it very much intersects and confirms the reorganization, as I indicated in my original question. Um, I guess it's about 30 years ago when uh, what was called the Mississippi Rule was adopted for analyzing uh, bank mergers. And in the ensuing decades, uh, there have been three fundamental developments that really have transformed the competitive landscape. The first was federal legal authorization of physical interstate banking. The second was technological enabling of virtual interstate banking, non-bank competitors, and substitutability and disruption. And the third was the utilization of technology as a competitive advantage. And it's obviously these latter two sets of developments that are making such a competitive difference today. So we have technology enabling a host of lenders, uh, the so-called fintechs, to compete uh, not only without a physical presence, but without even a bank charter. And of perhaps at least equal, if not more competitive significance banks compete today without a physical presence. Uh, one of the largest auto lenders, Ally, and two of the largest credit card lenders, American Express and Capital One, have no or only limited physical presence. Now, less obviously, but of at least equal competitive significance, I would suggest, large banks are able to increase their market share uh, through their virtual as well as their physical channels. And what you have with the major banks in this country today is really a hybrid model that can be modified as consumer preferences change. Technology, I think, has also altered the financial services competitive landscape other than directly through delivery channels. I think technology has always been 
or at least long been regarded as a competitive weapon because it could help reduce expense. But what has happened primarily in the last 10 years is that technology has moved from the back office to the front office as it enables banks to market much more effectively. And just one word about fintechs. To date, you have seen basically two types of providers. Those who are lenders, such as Lending Club and SoFi, but you also see those who compete with banks in a different sphere, which is payments or deposit equivalents. And whether that is a PayPal or Apple in the first instance, or the money market mutual funds in the second. So uh, you do have this merger in a sense, in I guess lowercase m or pun or whatever, uh, of banking and technology. And that's what again makes uh, the competitive uh, approach, which make in its outline the analytical and regulatory approach uh, so, uh, as I said at the outset, uh, critical in timing. And, and again, you are seeing these vertical uh, mergers emerging for the first time with banks and non-banks. We have um, a Lending Club, again, uh, announcing an acquisition of a bank going the other way, American Express just announcing the acquisition of Cabbage. Uh, just uh, one other comment which I uh, feel almost constrained to make, compelled to make, and that relates to uh, make its comment about you, you're doing things, the department is doing things now. And frankly, we have seen real evidence of that. We have seen a more analytical and less by the book set of rules uh, in dealing with bank mergers, Macon mentioned SunTrust bb and That is clearly an example, but I'd like to give another one. Uh, there isn't a lot of publicity when nothing really happens, but there was a recent transaction involving First Horizon in Iberia. And uh, if there's anything which can be more difficult, problematic, than having to divest a number of branches, it's to have to divest just one or two. And that was what was involved there. And uh, there was an analysis performed of a couple of mar markets where the merger did not meet the standard guidelines. Uh, you always have an advantage when you're able to discuss uh, these situations with Aaron Grace, who I think is on the phone and has for well, knows more about uh, competitive analysis and bank mergers than everybody else combined. And in that transaction, no branch divestiture was required and the merger was able to close on schedule. So I think we're seeing the reality of what Macon is described as an organizational matter play out in the department's analysis. Thank you so much, um, Raj. Um, Megan, have you seen sort of similar um, evolution as from your seat um, at the Department of Justice? As you, I mean, I think you touched on this a little bit and some of what was driving the reorganization, but I don't know if you've had kind of a similar experience as you've looked across the landscape. Oh, we did. And, and I think you were, we're going to see probably more of these as we see more transactions that will be coming up, either new, nascent, uh, disruptors that might be acquired and incorporated into the traditional um, industry participants. But I think we're seeing more services and goods that are crossing the line, just as I think over the past seven, eight years, we've seen the evolution go from, uh, you know, and how we enjoy our uh, music and movies uh, go from you know, whatever they were, CDs, to downloads, to streaming, to, you know, different types, you start blurring the line between what is radio, what is broadcast, you know, is it uh, a broadcast station and cable? So you had a number of those uh, occur, and I think we're starting to see that. Now, there's a different regulatory environment for financial services, as you all know, and, and Raj 
will know better than any one of us uh, that whole world. So it does change. And it, one thing that we do and we haven't really discussed is that the antitrust division has been engaging in a lot of competition advocacy. So we've done that with the SEC and Jay Clayton has been probably one of the best leaders of that commission uh, in recent years. Uh, and he's been very open to that type of input but also in other, you know, HHS, as they're looking at new rules of interoperability of health records, we have been the officious inner meddlers uh, to give them our views on competition. So in financial services, I anticipate the, this section is going to build the type of expertise to also do competition advocacy and work with the CFTC or the OCC and the Fed to provide that information rather than just the, you know, the statutory requirements we have in banks or other areas, but to be much more proactive about how they think about the regulations and how they think about their enforcement. So, uh, but, but there has been the, you know, the natural evolution we're seeing, and I think we're gonna see more. I think as we'll see how the regulatory environment responds to uh, things like blockchain technology, but the incredible efficiencies that that technology could bring to the financial services uh, world uh, will be huge. And, um, and those will, uh, you know, will disrupt a lot of folks. And as you know, more than just government employees, traditional corporations don't like to be disrupted. And they sometimes a lot of anti-competitive activity is because of the fear of the disruption. Some of them, the better ones, in, uh, you know, accept it and grab it and innovate with it. Some of them would like to eke it out. And we saw that within the music industry, for example, that resisted streaming for as long as they could. Uh, but there's a natural progression that we are seeing, and I'm hoping that this reorganization will continue to keep the division at the front line. Great, thanks so much. Jared, I thought I'd turn it over to you a little bit um, as you come at this with an additional perspective and different perspective as you look at um, bank charters and the ability of fintech companies to get those charters. And I thought I'd turn it over to you for a little bit to talk about that. Sure, happy to. And and, and we're, we're lucky to have Colleen here, who I know has done a lot of work on the on the OCC's fintech charter, so she can weigh in as well. But it, it it's an interesting question as, as these fintechs develop and they offer one financial service and they do it well and they do it on a cool app that people has, you know, the people have grown to like, how do they sort of become the, the one-stop shop for, um, you know, for people for financial services. Now, um, if they were to become a bank, there's a lot of reasons why that is tough. We did, we did have what I believe is the first FinTech company, Varro Money, which actually got an actual bank charter just recently. So th that is a path that some could look at and there's reasons why people do or don't go the full bank path. But one of the big questions people deal with is how do they provide sort of the full range of services? Um, you know, we've seen um, the ILC charter, so the industrial loan company, which has been, you know, a hot button for, for years. There was a moratorium, it came back, but there were two ILC um, approvals uh, for, for uh, Square and, and Nelnet, which were the first two um, in a long time. And, and, you know, with that came additional round of trade groups getting, um, coming out against them, congressmen coming out against them. So it, it, it's, a, it's a hot button issue where people still have, you know, lots of answers. We've seen a lot of fintech say the charter's not worth it. They can get the same benefits from partnering um, with a bank. So a lot of these people have, instead of becoming a bank um, or being acquired by a bank or acquiring a bank, have just entered into arrangements with banks to provide um, banking service, you know, so they can provide their customers banking services. And then that's not only fintech, there's a deal where, you know, State Farm with U.S. Bank, where they made it so that U.S. Bank can provide banking services to State Farm customers. So it's really something that we're seeing all over and that people if you have one aspect of a relationship, how do you keep the customer? How do you provide them services? So it, it's something that we're gonna see a lot more of. I think the charter question um, is one that will continue. I'd love Colleen's views on, on where we go with the FinTech charter. But I think if you look at the most recent comments from, from Brian Brooks, the acting, you know, the commissioner now, he was focused on, you know, at some point, 
demand lets us get to some get to how we deal with charters. So, you know, the walls get broken down by customer demand. And once the walls get broken down, how do you deal with it? So I, I think we are seeing a lot of this come to a head and, and will continue to, particularly as people have moved more and more to mobile banking transactions and sort of wanting to have more online. Colleen, I think um, Jared's teed it up nicely for um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, some of the issues he flagged as well as um, some recent cases that you were involved in. Yeah, so just as a little bit of background. Um, so my name is Colleen Honigsberg. I'm a pro associate professor here at Stanford Law. And as background, I actually have a PhD in accounting or as my mom likes to say, bookkeeping. Um, and so I don't do antitrust and said my research is really empirical analysis of corporate and securities law. And so that's sort of what brought me here today was a paper that I wrote. It was actually several years ago, but on Madden versus Midland. And my guess is that many of you guys who are in the audience today are very, very familiar with Madden. Um, but given that many of the people here are probably antitrust might be a little bit less familiar. So I just want to start off with some background. Um, so you know, most states have usury laws. And what surprised me when I looked into this is that some of these laws are actually really low. So for example, five or 6%. Moreover, some of the penalties for violating state usury laws can actually be really harsh. Um, for example, in some states, the law can just be completely void, or sorry, the loan can just be completely void. So, you know, as lenders, you really don't want to violate state usury laws. But um, as Jared mentioned, we sort of have a solution for that, or at least we think we have a solution for that, which is this sort of bank, non-bank partnership. Um, and this works because under federal law, banks can preempt state usury laws. Um, and instead, when uh, this national bank issues a loan, that loan is going to be subject to the usury law of the state in which the bank is located. Um, so this is why like your credit card bills come from states like Utah, which have no usury limit. Um, so this preemption basically gives us the valid when made doctrine, um, which says that as long as the loan is valid when it's made, it will be valid thereafter. Um, so as long as we just need to be compliance, in compliance with initial rules um, when we issue that loan, and then we'll preempt state usury laws thereafter. So this is where Madden comes in because it arguably severed that chain. Um, so Madden was the second circuit opinion and the court they basically looked at this and this arrangement where you had a loan that was issued by a national bank, B of A, and then had eventually been sold to a debt collector, Midland. Um, and the court said, well, this sort of federal usury preemption only applies to the loan when it's actually held by a bank. Once it's sold to this non-bank, um, the preemption doesn't apply anymore. So in effect, the second target was like turning on state usury laws, which people you know, thought were preempted. So you can imagine this has very significant implications for banking in general, um, securitization, debt collection, et cetera, um, but especially for fintech. So when I saw this case several years ago, I had reached out to a couple uh, marketplace lenders and I got data from uh, private data from three marketplace lenders to see what happened following the case. And what I saw was that for people who had high FICO scores, you really didn't see any difference. Um, and no surprise there, the loans that they're getting are already gonna be, you know, the state usury law wasn't an issue. However, for the people who had um, lower, you know, FICO scores, they just completely dropped out of the data set because the lender stopped issuing loans. So in my data set, um, I had thousands and thousands and thousands of loans, but after July, 2015, Madden was at the end of May, there was literally not a single loan issued to a single second circuit borrower who had a FICO score below 640. Um, and when I spoke to the lenders about this, they told me unequivocally, this is Madden. So just as a sort of pitch here, I have been trying to follow, uh, do a follow-up study to this for years now, and I have been having an issue getting data. If anybody here wants to supply me with data, I would love to do a follow-up. And um, but anyway, anyway, so I think there are very significant implications here. And when I first saw this case, I would have thought years later that it would have been resolved. Um, I would have been wrong, but they've tried to resolve it in a couple of ways. So first, um, you know, Midland had asked a uh, Supreme Court to look at it. The Supreme Court uh, got the Solicitor General's view. Solicitor General said the quick case was quote, incorrect. 
um, but didn't take it. They also tried to get a legislative fix. Um, there were several bills that were proposed that would have been a, a fix. None of them have ever been passed. So we most recently, um, OCC and FDIC actually adopted a proposed rule that you know is called the Madden Fix, which basically it doesn't address all of the issues in the case, but it addresses kind of the main one of like this valid one made issue, and sort of repairs that. Um, the question though is whether they really have the ability to actually you know, adopt that rule. And so the case, the sort of OCC's proposed rule that, you know, it's trying to adopt um, has already been challenged. And that happened a couple of weeks ago that various state attorney generals um, filed, you know, saying that basically the OCC lacked authority to actually adopt this rule. So, you know, all of these different fixes through the standard legal regimes, you know, kind of still uncertain, um, you know, almost, you know, five years later. Um, and instead, it, when I've spoken to people, it sounds like they have changed the loan style and that there are two main fixes that people, that the different lenders have mentioned to me that they've been doing to try to avoid the issues in Madden. Um, so uh, the first one, just very simply, arbitration clauses. Um, so the Madden actually, it was second circuit opinion, as I mentioned, and they did have a Delaware choice of law clause. Um, as it turned out, the court didn't honor the Delaware choice of law clause, um, but there's some thoughts that maybe if we do this all in arbitration, we can just sort of get rid of the issue. And then the second thing that it sounds like is actually more common is just the partner bank holds onto a significant portion of the loan. Um, so usually 5% or more and, you know, tries to then say, you know, make the argument that that bank um, has a significant interest in the loan and thus, you know, hasn't sort of severed the chain and Madden shouldn't apply. Um, so those are kind of the background issues in Madden. And I think then when Jared was talking about some of the OCC charter issues, you know, this is you know, part of why like those charters are so interesting and so, you know, appealing for many of the fintechs because you have this total just web work of complex, um, licensing rules at the state level, complex usury laws, and at least, you know, maybe the OCC charter looks very appealing um, because it just allows you to avoid some of that. And we're not sure if we're allowed to really rely on this bank non-bank partnership because there's, you know, been so many issues with it at the consumer level. Um, and I think that's a big reason why we've had so much interest in the OCC charter regime and you know, it's just unfortunate how uncertain that regime is as well. Um, and I think, you know, Jared mentioned that a bit too. So. Yeah, I think we've all, state money transmitter laws was something I yeah. did not expect to spend um, time on that I think all of us who were anywhere near this industry have had to learn because one of the things that um, banks get out of, but non-banks don't is, is the 50 state regime. It's now 50, I think it was 49 or 51 if you count. DC regime on, on what is a money transmitter business, a money services business, and what's required to be registered. Generally, the definitions tend to be anyone who touches money. So how do you deal with that? If you're a young startup, how do you deal with that? Um, complying in 50 states is a really, really tricky, um, tricky question. And it, it does lead to things like partnerships because it, it's hard to do on your own. Well, this um, discussion and kind of the expertise here really sort of highlights the need as you look at antitrust enforcement to really understand these industries and this complex web of um, regulation that's overlaying the transactions that antitrust lawyers are looking at. So this is really helpful. Um, one can thing I, just, I, yeah. can I just add, just to update, this is all moving with the speed of light and the FDIC has no longer escaped unscathed because they were sued today, just like the controller had been, so. Thanks. So this really is of the moment, um, which brings us to the moment that we're all in, um, that I wanted to talk, ask Jared, Raj, and really anybody on the panel. You know, as you talk about the evolution in the financial industry, how are you seeing the pandemic affecting what was already happening? Well, for me, and I'll turn it over to, I think, the real experts, Macon really hit the nail on the head early on um, when he talked about the increasing use of the phone, and Jared mentioned this as well. Um, the pandemic, per force, has required people to engage in banking remotely. 
And it's just a question of whether anyone will return, and if so, how many. So uh, the pandemic has changed habits, and when you form new habits, they're often very tough to break. That's exactly yeah, right. Great. And I, I think it even, you know, there's been banks who have focused on their mobile technology, the large banks, but um, some who haven't, and, you know, some of those are now sort of pivoting and having to rely on fintechs. But it's interesting that it's a, it's a user base that has certain demand. So there's been a couple articles about how, because of things like Uber and, you know, de delivery services, people want from their financial services apps that sort of do that. So it's not enough just to make deposits, people want control. So how do, how are banks, you know, able to provide that and can they provide that internally? And some of it's as simple as, you know, we've had banks struggle. They can't hire great programmers because they don't have Macs. They, their systems are not set up for, for Macs. And, you know, some of the people who are coders don't want to work at a bank. So there, there is, this is a good time, you know, for FinTech in that sense. There's other things about the pandemic that are really tough for fintech, right? There's been a flight to quality, so people do worry more um, in these times. Capital is much harder. You know, we've talked a little bit about the lenders. It's a tough time for lenders that require, require securitizations, um, you know, so, so it's an interesting time. There are, there are a lot of opportunities, but, you know, their role and how banks decide to either develop the technology on their own or acquire those companies or rely on that technology you know, will be really interesting. It plays into the comments people made earlier about BB&C SunTrust, where technology and ability to compete for those two large banks was, was an important factor. So I think we're seeing more and more of that. I think this probably put that, this all, you know, ahead of schedule from what it would have been, but it was a direction, you know, people saw this going in. Yeah, um, you know, teeing off of that, Megan, you know, you see a lot of, uh, you're seeing transactions, conduct, you know, looking across the space, probably a lot of thought that went into this reorganization as well. Where are you seeing the disruptive competition? Are there verticals where, you know, you guys are really observing this more, um, whether in currency or banking um, in general? I don't know if you have thoughts there. Uh, so we are uh, just because we're forced to, uh, we get to review uh, a couple of recent transactions uh, I mentioned, um, and I believe both are public. Uh, I hope they are, because I'm just about to mention them, but Visa Plaid and MasterCard Finicity are just two of them. And we're seeing uh, those uh, within the you know, payment systems area um, as just, you know, it, it's fascinating, and those are, I'm not going to mention much, but I've been very much involved with both of those reviews and uh, regularly getting updated because they just seem to be the type that could help disrupt a current system uh, and a system that, you know, has been a repeats customer within the antitrust division. Um, and it's fascinating because more and more consumers are finding the freedom to be able to use that. Uh, we should also you know, mention that across the world, just outside of our own regulatory system, uh, there are other countries that uh, treat some of these uh, differently. I mean, we look at, I mean, I know China has been in um, the news more so lately, but they have a number of uh, major uh, platforms and technology companies where, where, where they handle all the transactions. So if you're uh, you know, on Tencent or Alibaba, and they have their own payment system, uh, which, you know, you could see some of our bigger platforms in the United States perhaps going to it. So instead of, you know, you're, you're acquiring, um, you're, you're purchasing something on Amazon, there's no reason why Amazon couldn't create its own uh, payment system and currency within it. Uh, that people can use. You don't even need a credit card at that point. Maybe you could bypass some of the traditional uh, mechanisms. So we're beginning to see that, but I think we're going to see, it's just natural. We're going to see more and more. The only limits, and I think uh, appropriate ones in, in a lot of circumstances will be making sure that it's not used for illicit uh, conduct, uh, You know, whether it's uh, human trafficking or drugs or money laundering. And that's, you know, really the, the competencies of the others. But I don't think 
the use of the technology, whether it's cryptocurrencies or other mechanisms, is going to be stopped. Those will be developed and they'll get to a place where there will be you know, appropriate regulation to deal with the know your customer rules and other money laundering, anti-money laundering rules. Uh, and then we'll be able to use it. And that is you know, understanding that the competitive dynamics is gonna be really key for us to make sure one, uh, we ensure the healthy competition that's required, but two, making sure that we don't screw something up by inappropriately blocking uh, something that could disrupt the system and be much more pro-consumer. Um, and that's, that's why the economists are going to be key. And that's what we're going through some of the training to make sure they know, at least know enough, you know, none of, none of them are gonna become experts in computer programming, but know enough to know what kinds of questions bring in the right experts to better appreciate the network effects. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. Um, let's just open it up to the rest of the panel. If there's places that you're really seeing in your day-to-day -day practice or in your um, uh, academic work, real pockets of disruption that are notable that we haven't touched on yet. Jared, no. <laughs> we have touched on a lot um, so far uh, in various industries. Um, if folks don't have, a, if I have no, no, no. It, it is, it is, it is a good point, and and I, I will, I will jump into it because there, we in as a financial services lawyer, I mean, this has been a time where we have seen much more of this than than ever, and much more of it happening outside of the bank. So even if you look at the PPP program, um, so much of that, in a way that was probably something that no one would have thought would be possible, um, you know, even a year ago, went through non-bank. So, you know, uh, you know, Cabbage, which Raj mentioned was acquired, I, I believe had, was either the second most or third most by number of loans. They were similar to JP Morgan as far as number of loans. Now the dollar value um, is significantly smaller. On the other hand, that has benefits too, that they were reaching, you know, I, I think they had something like $38,000 in average loan size. So, you know, th that was probably unfathomable a couple of years ago. Even if you look at the bank numbers, you know, Cross River Bank, um, was 12 or so on that list and is nowhere near in assets, you know, anyone um, who they are situated with on that list. So it shows that even in sort of a government program where we need to get money, the government needs to get money to people, um, you know, there was a role for technology and disruptive technology in that kind of program. And, and in some ways, hard to see how it would have gotten out the way it did without you know, that sort of technology, even the banks themselves, of course, stood up programs in a matter of days, which they could only do if they had invested a ton in technology and they understood how to process loans on a, on a quick basis. So even if you look at a, a government program now, it, it relied heavily on, you know, technology and, and benefited from sort of the availability of, you know, some non-bank or, you know, non-traditional bank participants to be able to get in there and, and step in. I was just going to go back for a moment uh, to what I regarded as Colleen's uh, groundbreaking work on uh, Madden. I think what this shows is the importance of data. We can all analyze in the abstract. Uh, that's often not that useful without the facts. And what Colleen did, I think, was instrumental in showing the problems which Madden created. And we're going to need that for many aspects as we move forward of the financial services revolution. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, and for what it's worth, if any of you guys are interested in data on PPP, um, as Jared was speaking, I at one point had looked up sort of estimated fees of what I think the different banks, based on the data that were disclosed, we can't exactly figure out how much um, the different banks were earned in fees uh, for reasons that I can describe if you're interested, but probably aren't relevant. Um, but when I look at sort of fee estimate for cabbage, they would be, you know, well over a hundred million just for cabbage, just for loans that were directly through them and cross river, you know, well over 200 million um, just in terms of, you know, fees that they're making on their on a loan. Incredible. 
Um, Megan, turning back to another recent announcement from the agency, um, you and Raj both mentioned that one of the growing trends in financial services is an increasing, increasing vertical mergers, and you've touched on some of those already here. Um, of course, you at DOJ and the Federal Trade Commission recently released your um, vertical merger guidelines. Um, how do you think those guidelines will impact the analysis of mergers in the financial industry? Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, that was another one. After 36 years, we updated how we look at uh, <laughs> uh, vertical transactions. But really, the, the goal of it was to provide, you know, both uh, the business community and antitrust practitioners um, increased transparency into what we do. What is the analytical process we go under? Of course, the AT&T Time Warner lawsuit brought, you know, vertical mergers out into the forefront and uh, you know a lot of people became experts in when and where we've ever uh, uh, we hadn't litigated a vertical merger case in about 40 years but there's been a lot of enforcement so we built went back looked at those um, in a lot of ways uh, you know I think the uh, guidelines all they do is really put in place on paper the practices that as enforcers we have been uh, engaging in and looking at non-merger guidelines. Um, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, we talk about vertical mergers and even though by and large, most of the anti-competitive problems we find is through the horizontal transactions and the overlaps is that the vertical mergers are not always benign. And, you know, there are times where we have to step in as Congress uh, told us, uh, to ensure it's the same test, the substantial lessening competition. Um, and, and in the guidelines, we show a couple of areas and how we would get there. And it's whether or not the vertical relationship between the two firms will either foreclose or increase, you know, create a foreclosure or increase the rival's costs. Um, and we need to take a look in more of these transactions. Uh, whether or not that is the case. So sometimes it could be data, data could be the input uh, upstream uh, to, a, to, the, to, to an important asset. And if that is foreclosed from other competitors, it will cause competitive harm. And um, I don't know if we have seen that quite yet, um, although we'd be happy to talk about you know, the uh, refinitive transaction where, the, where the, the guidelines was actually first put to test there. And that was an interesting one because, um, you know, we had to take a hard look to see what will there be foreclosure problems that would violate the law. Well, you anticipated my next question, which was ah. exactly related to that transaction. Um, and so what can you tell us about how the division and I analyzed the transaction? Um, and also, you know, as you, after that, if you could maybe touch on why you thought it was important to issue a closing statement in that case, which is not as common. Um, as one might expect. So anxious to hear about that. It is true, not common, but I'll, I'll be happy to explain kind of my thought process of why, why I thought it was important in that case. So, uh, you know, uh, for, for those who may not have followed it, the London Stock Exchange Group, uh, which on the one hand operates, you know, some trading platforms such as the London Stock Exchange, uh, acquired uh, Refinitiv, which is a provider of, uh, you know, certain financial market data and infrastructure. And, you know, I think you step back and your natural view is that it's a complementary transaction. It will be positive. Um, and I think we went into it with that, but, you know, had a robust investigation um, in that transaction. And we looked at both you know, are there vertical uh, relationships between them that would cause either a foreclosure uh, or um, any kind of other w concerns we should have, such as raising the rival's cost to the point where it's anti-competitive. Um, what was fascinating was that, you know, even though at times they were competing with each other uh, in the proprietary data that the exchange would have, um, in a lot of ways, they both had a reverse relationship in which one was the upstream and which one was the downstream uh, input provider. And so that was kind of interesting. 
it was the first time we had actually applied the analytical uh, framework we had put down into those new guidelines to a transaction. Uh, we looked and um, what we ultimately found was that, um, you know, the changes, you know, whether it's changes to the licensing terms for proprietary data or otherwise, would not have uh, lessened competition because there was other competitors uh, in play that could have helped. And in a lot of ways, it provided some uh, pro-competitive benefits for some of the customers uh, already. And so some, some of the synergies were beneficial. Because it was a complex transaction and because it was the first time we had applied the vertical merger guidelines, I thought it was important to put out there for the purposes of transparency. And again, you know, to the extent it's valuable for some guidance uh, for future transactions of what went into the transaction, uh, into our investigation. Uh, I know there's some foreign, you know, uh, uh, antitrust enforcers that are currently still reviewing the transaction. Um, and they might have uh, a, a different view, hopefully they won't. Um, but uh, I think as far as the competitive impacts now, you know, there might be a different set of impacts within different geographies based on the regulatory environment of those two firms. Um, but I anticipate that other enforcers will probably find that it did not uh, pose a competitive threat. Well, as a practitioner, I always look forward to the closing statements when they're appropriate to be issued. So <laughs> enjoy seeing them. Um, I just speaking of mergers and also another one that was mentioned earlier in the panel that would be interesting to touch on and hear your perspective about it was the BB and T SunTrust transaction. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that case? Um, it's, you know, another example of significant consolidation in the banking industry with significant divestitures. So what are the key takeaways that people could have from looking at this transaction? Uh, is that for me? Uh, yeah, because Raj could probably tell us more about that <laughs> transaction than I could ever learn. I but. know. I don't know if he's somewhat more limited in what he can say, but obviously we welcome hearing from him as well. Let me give you my kind of the, from, from the enforcers. And, and it was an important one for me um, because I learned also how we apply uh, our merger, our bank merger guidelines to a banking industry. So that was a, you know, that was one of the larger, perhaps it might have been the largest uh, banking uh, merger since the financial crisis. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we have traditionally at the antitrust division apply the screen that we provide to the banking regulators, whether it's the Fed, FDIC, or the OCC, or all of the above, depending on the transaction. And we will, you know, do a screen, we look at it, and it's, it's a bit formulaic. And so as, as the transaction went on, and one of my bad habits is that I've been uh, quite intrusive in various transactions. I don't wait till the final day when, you know, there's a request to meet, which usually means we're about to sue in a week, um, is that I get involved and I'd like to be briefed earlier in these transactions and in the investigations and get an idea of why we're going a certain way. Well, one, one thing I learned was that these guidelines were based on the 19, 1992 merger guidelines and the HHI uh, thresholds that we used to apply in 92. In fact, the 2010 horizontal merger guidelines specifically exempted out the 19, these, these bank merger screens. And, um, as, as the staff was coming up and looking at it and saying, well, here's what we're doing. And I said, well, does this, you know, if this was, you know, if we were selling ice cream, uh, would we apply the same economic test as this? So let me just give you a random example. You know, we, we look at counties and whether, where branches are. And, you know, uh, if you live in the Washington, D.C. area, you can, you can drive 15 minutes and go through five counties. And... Uh, did it make sense uh, from an economic standpoint? So I asked our deputy, our chief economist, Dr. Jeff Wilder, to get involved and look at the review that we did. Um, we, re you know, we conducted, I think, over 100 uh, uh, interviews and thousands and thousands of documents and analyzed all sorts of data. Ultimately, 
it led to a divestiture package. I think a lot of the anti-competitive conduct was local. So uh, I think it was 25-ish or so uh, branches that we requested uh, be divested and the parties I think, complied. Um, it was worth about, I don't know, a two billion or so dollars worth of deposits. But there were a lot of pro-competitive aspects and synergies of, a, of that transaction to be able to compete in that, in that mid-market that they were in. Um, there's a lot of costs of IT integration uh, involved as more and more of these banks need to incur that cost. So we were able to find a solution uh, to harness the pro-competitive aspects of that merger, but then uh, divest those harms. But we didn't clearly t apply those 1992 screens. Um, uh, we looked at it, I think, in a, in a more modern approach uh, where the divestitures were a lot less, but it made a lot more sense because the consumer at the local level who might be you know, living across some county line is now going to have uh, you know, the ability to work with a more competitive bank rather than two less competitive banks or one you know, super bank and one smaller one that's going to remain smaller. So we learned a lot about how it was done. And that was probably also one of the other reasons that led to this combination is that you know, the same people who've been doing the same reviews, who do a great job, but have a analytical framework, um, they could benefit from the other financial services areas. And so uh, we're doing that. And it's also led to us looking at updating those, those bank merger guidelines. Um, uh, so yet another effort. So there'll be a yet another change that I'm sure some people will not like, but some people will really embrace. Uh, but I think it makes sense given where the economy is and where our economic understanding is of, of markets. Well, um, Raj, I didn't know if you had more to add there. We have just one minute before the end of this really fascinating panel. It's gone by so quickly. I feel like we have an hour's worth more content available, but um, the time is coming. I would, if I can do it in 30 seconds, uh, I think the solution reached in SunTrust bb and was an analytical one, not a simplistic one. And it was, it would have been too easy to say bigger is bad. And that was not what happened. Well, thank you for those final remarks. And thank you so much to the entire panel for letting me be here with you. I'm sure um, the audience enjoyed it as well. Hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.